The truck and the rock grinder are untouched by the point changes that have come the way of the cult. And with the gene stealer cult ambush rule receiving a nerf, making it harder for infantry units to come back, let's look closer at what mechanized gene stealer cult can do. Our tanks, our transports, and our bikes. When thinking of the tanks and transports of the gene stealer cult, I am not talking about the Brood Brothers. If you want to know which Lehman Ross is the best to support this army, I have a whole video dedicated to that tank. With its points reduced, it has become a much better choice. Deploy it opposite its ideal target and have fun. But let's begin with the Gene Stealer Cult's biggest tank that we have. It's still actually pretty light, but when we are the Rusted Claw style army, riding the angry road, we will either fall by the wayside or rise for Ascension Day. The Goliath Rock Grinder is okay as a tank. It has toughness 10, so Melter Guns are wounding it on a 5+ much to the chagrin of the Sisters of Battle, but a 3 plus save and 10 wounds are not going to keep it going for very long, if the enemy puts any kind of serious anti-tank firepower into it. But it is not designed to endure, it is designed to crush and destroy. It has a transport capacity of 6, so it is an idea to put 5 metamorphs inside. So metamorphs do have a use because then, the Metamorph Scout ability transfers to the Rock Grinder, and it gets to scout 6 inches before the game starts. So Metamorphs do have a use, even if they still lose out to the Acolytes as a unit to build. And when I was discussing the points changes, I went over in detail benefits and disadvantages between the Acolytes and the Metamorphs. It would then be possible that we could want to add some more characters to the Metamorphs, like the Biophagus for example, however then we lose the Scout ability, because if there is a character without Scout in a unit with Scout, the unit doesn't scout. Scout, 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 scouty scout. And we want the rock granite to scout. The reason we want the rock granite to scout is to get it up towards the enemy as soon as possible. Its 12 inch move will help with that, but adding with the scout, that means you're looking at roughly six inches to go before you're reaching the enemy front lines. That's a very doable charge. When you charge, we have grinding clearance. So when you end a charge move, you hit an enemy, you roll 66 for every 4+, plus. it's a mortal wound. But that's not the only mortal wounds we're going to be doing, because we have a very nice tank shock. The rock grinder will be rolling 10 dice with tank shock, and assuming that the enemy's toughness is 9 or lower, we get 2 extra dice, so that's 12 dice. For every 5+, plus, that's another mortal wound. So we're looking at a further 4 mortal wounds on average for 7 average in total. The tank shock itself caps out at 6, but that makes no reference to grinding clearance, so we can have 7 mortal wounds between the two things, no problem. Once it's in combat, you really want to be hitting something that's a tank, a monster, a vehicle that you want removing, a dreadnought, something like that that's been used to oppress the gene stealer cult. Against infantry, it will grind up 3 models with a space marine kind of profile, an MEQ. We've been over this what the abbreviations mean, but a tank will suffer much more because then the high strength is what we need when the Gene Stealer Cult are mostly an infantry based small arms fire army with not a great deal of anti-tank. We can of course be doing more mortal wounds to the enemies when the Goliath Rock Grinder does get destroyed and it is quite a light vehicle then assuming you roll a 6 it's deadly demise d3 so this is why I want to scout it and move it way up away from our own forces for that explosion. For additional anti-tank firepower I would recommend the heavy mining laser or the heavy seismic cannon to be supporting your destructive capabilities. If you have scouted your rock grinder then you're probably going to be within 12 inches of the enemy on the first turn even if you go first and the enemy hasn't moved out of their deployment zone. So you'll be firing 6 shots hitting on a 4 plus at strength 8 minus 2 doing d3 damage. If you weren't using metamorphs to scout Perhaps the heavy mining laser is better because it has the longer range that you may need for hitting the enemy vehicles before they hit you. I don't think the clearance incinerator is necessary on this vehicle. We have a lot of anti-infantry firepower with literally everything else. And all of the claws on things like the acolytes and the metamorphs can be quite effective at anti-infantry damage. If you didn't go first, scouting will let you move the rock grinder to a place of relative safety, ready to then move up 12 inches and charge the enemy. But the metamorphs, once they're out, they can use one with the darkness to become safe from enemy shooting. That is about the only way to stay safe when there are just five models. I think you'll have to accept that the rock grinder, after it's done its one valiant charge, will quickly have ground its last rock. Especially once your opponent sees what it has done to their prize unit. 
There are other units you could put inside as an alternative to Metamorph. Problem then is you lose this valuable scout move. Aberrants, five aberrants with possibly an abominant could be brought closer to the fight or dropped off closer to an objective to hold that as a big block of meat that the enemy will have difficulty punching through. Alternatively, five gene stealers, as they have the speed to be able to get out before the rock grinder moves, advance and then charge. As you can't normally move or charge if the transport is moved, the gene stealer's speed is what will allow them to stay safe relatively within the rock grinder and then charge out and make a charge before the enemies had a chance to shoot them. Overwatch being the exception. So once your metamorphs or aberrants or gene stealers have gotten off to do their job, the rock grinder can be doing its own thing. The rock grinder is not as flashy as the cult limo, but it does its job. You know that the limo was not an official model. It was kit bashed and everyone loved it. So in basically every fan index between second edition and sixth edition, the limo has appeared. Well, let's assume that there is no limo available. What does Botherington upon Sea, now located within a desert setting, for the aesthetic, have as a replacement bus service? It has the cult truck. Another light vehicle, but even lighter than the rock grinder, to the point where grenade launchers are wounding it on a 4+. This is one of the rare vehicles that is providing a high transport capacity and fire support as a rule. Other factions have the Falcons and the Razorbacks that have a transport capacity of 6, and the same fire support rule. We get a transport capacity of 12. Fire support means that a unit that gets out can reroll wound rolls against something that the truck has scored a hit against, as there are not many shots coming out of the truck, and you might roll badly, I would have all of the truck guns fire at the same target just to make sure you get at least one hit. For the units you may want inside, a unit of acolytes with demo charges is not a bad idea. Because we can no longer use the tunnel crawler's stratagem twice in a turn, this is something that lets you deploy acolytes from deep strike within three inches, a range with which you can then use demo charges. We could previously do it twice thanks to the nexus, but now that the rules have changed their ability, only battle tactics can be used for free or more than once per phase. However, the reroll to wound is not particularly valuable on the strength 12 demo charges, because against the majority of things you'll be wounding on twos anyway, and the acolytes get to reroll once to wound against enemies on objectives. Neophytes though, even 10 of them, could be a cheaper way of holding objectives in the midboard, more at like a thousand points than two thousand points. The rerolls to wound on their auto guns and seismic cannons and flamers and webbers for that devastating wounds ability could be quite nice at clearing enemy light infantry from an objective. Ten metamorphs isn't bad, gives you even more scouting. The rerolls to wound on hand flamers that are already auto hitting could give them some actual effectiveness. I'm seeing a good use of metamorphs in this list, especially now that they cost less than acolytes. They could be in a truck, get out, sit on an objective, maybe with a locus. Enemies will want to charge them to get onto the objective as they kick the metamorphs off, and having fight first with the locus is nice. Or just having 10 metamorphs that fight on death on a 3 plus anyway is not bad for mauling the enemy as you go down. We could also put aberrants or pure strain gene stealers into the truck, but these are combat units in a vehicle that supports shooting. The aberrants might appreciate the extra speed to get around, but they're tough enough already without needing the extra armor in the form of a truck, and the gene stealers would use their infiltrate ability, and the devastating wounds on their claws would not be possible because the only way to get that is to include a patriarch, and the patriarch expressly cannot be transported in a truck. So what do we do with the truck? What's its role on the battlefield? Well, it looks like it has a pretty good role in taking infantry to an objective and helping them shoot better when the neophytes or metamorphs get out to better clear the objective. That will be best. It could just drive around shooting things because it has a firing deck of 12. That means that 10 neophytes inside can all fire. That, combined with the auto cannon and the heavy stubber, is some pretty nasty anti-infantry firepower just from weight of bullets. After dropping off a unit on an objective, you could charge the enemy, not to like, do anything, just to inconvenience them. And with big guns never tire, which I've explained in detail here, you could still fire your heavy stubber and your auto cannon but at minus one to hit. Or we could focus entirely on demolition charges. A similar idea to having the neophytes move around and throw out firepower from the safety within a truck, we would do the same thing but with added fire. And you know how much I love fire. Acolytes with hand flamers, not the best weapon, but you would be going close, close enough to use demo charges. The demolition cache on the truck can be used over and over again. It is not one shot. The Acolyte's demo charges are. But here is where we enter the rules debate part of the video. Ugh. The demo charges are one shot, but firing deck lets you give the weapons over to the truck. 
The rules on one shot are that the bearer can only shoot it once per game. So giving the demo charge to the truck means that the truck will have fired it once per game, and then the acolytes getting out would still have their demo charges to fire. That model, as the bearer, has not fired. We could assume that they were then able to pick up another one from the apparently inexhaustible cache of demolition charges on board the truck, but I think that's unintended. I would stick with the demo charges the acolytes have as once per game, they can pass it to the truck, or they can use it themselves. As trucks have been rarely used in the Gene Stealer cut lists, this has not really come up much. Comment now on how you interpret it. Do the acolytes still have their demo charge when they get out, or not? Dr. Crankenfoo says it can be used forever, but he is ride or die on rules as written compared to rules as intended. Don't side with Dr. Crankenfoo. Stop being influenced by the influencers. So the truck can be very useful for battlefield support. A vehicle we have that's better for battlefield support is the Ridge Runner. And there are three different ways to use the Ridge Runner. It is a very light vehicle, but that also means it's rather cheap. Currently coming in at 85 points. And it can do three different jobs. It can be a very cheap way to hold an objective and perform secondaries, or it can provide some anti-tank support that in the Gene Stealer Cult Army is otherwise only reliably provided by demo charge acolytes. Or it can be used in a role to support those acolytes and neophytes. The best gun options for each are varied. So if you want to support the neophytes and make the most use of this crossfire rule, which means that any unit shooting at that enemy target after the Ridge Runner has fired will be improving the armor penetration of their guns by one. So making an autogun armor penetration one is great for clearing hordes and making those demo charges on the acolytes armor penetration minus three is really going to help with that anti-tank or really, for the profile the demo charge is, anti anything and everything. The best way to trigger this crossfire ability will be to use the heavy mortar. It has the most shots, and as long as you have one hit, then the crossfire will trigger. The heavy mortar is also indirect fire and blast, improving the number of shots, and meaning you can fire it without needing to be anywhere near the enemy. To make the crossfire even better, you would support this with a survey auger that will give friendly Gene Stealer Cult units ignores cover against the target unit. This is of course assuming that they're not using the Ascension Day Detachment, the only one currently available to us, which provides ignores cover when your unit deploys from Deep Strike. But if you were firing this at a unit of heavy infantry, like Terminators, it could nicely support our other tanks like the Rock Grinder firing its massive laser, which also has blast and has the armor penetration that the terminators would be getting the benefit of cover. Best ignore that. So if you want to support your other Gene Steel Cult units, Heavy Mortar and the Auger. If you want to do some anti-tank support, then either the Achilles Missile Launcher or the Heavy Mining Laser. I prefer the Heavy Mining Laser as its profile continues to be better than the missiles, even though the missiles are more reliable looking, with a flat 3 attacks rather than D3 and a flat 3 damage rather than D6 plus 1. To make your anti-tank shots even more likely to hit, you want to support that with the spotter, so that your ballistic skill is improved to 3 plus. Heavy mining laser and spotter for anti-tank style. The third way to use the ridge runner is to just go after objectives. The speed of the ridge runner at 12 inches and the ability to scout 9 inches means you can get onto objectives very quickly. Once you're there, you just need to survive. So you want to be out of line of sight, and if you're unlucky enough to be spotted, then you're going to need the flare launcher, so you have the smoke keyword, which allows you to use the smoke screen stratagem. This gives you the benefit of cover and stealth. So it's minus one for enemies to shoot you, and assuming they have an armor penetration of at least one, you'll be getting a better save. The reason we have to choose smoke screen is because we can't use one with the darkness on vehicles. Now, because this is going to be hiding out of line of sight or rushing into the corners for secondary objectives and things like that, you will want the mortar because that can be used indirectly while you're hiding out of line of sight and it has the longest range if you were the furthest back in your own table corners. So if you have already built your Ridge Runner, rather than choosing to build it to match one of these three tactics, choose the tactic that matches how you've built it. I really like this vehicle because all of the options available are quite good. It can just take some matching up to realize how to use that particular build of the vehicle. This is one of the few units where you can have three in the army, the maximum number allowed, and they all do different things. But for this mechanized list that's mostly going to be vehicles, I would make sure you have at least one to be holding objectives and fulfilling the requirements of secondary objectives. Anytime it's not completing a secondary objective and can still fire, that heavy mortar can be doing double duty because crossfire will still be activating when it's fired. 
Oh, but our army can't be all vehicles. We need a warlord. So here is the Jackal Alphys. The Jackal Alphys is not a lone operative as we established in a previous Gene Stealer Cult sniper video. You can deploy the bike alone. A surprising number of people did not know that that was something you can do. Adding a character to a unit is optional. Something you can do. If you look at the Leviathan box set, you can see that Captain Flappy Bat is all alone and doesn't get the lone operative ability. Same for other Space Marine characters, only one of which is a lone operative. This 60 point model can be quite fast for moving around and performing secondary objective actions or holding primary objectives as long as it's not within line of sight of the enemy. That's cheaper than any infantry unit the Gene Steel Occult have without turning to Brood Brothers. Their weakness then is indirect fire. If the enemy has any kind of indirect fire, then the biker is done for. Imperial Guard mortar teams are quite common, but with the points changes in September that happened recently and the change to devastating wounds, you are less likely to see Eldari weapon platforms firing indirectly. It is also polite to tell your opponent that this model does not have lone operative. It is rare for people to know every unit from every codex, so do let them know out of fairness when they see you deploy it alone they will assume that this sniper is a lone operative. Logic dictates it should be, but she just keeps the bike running the whole time and the loud noises will let people know where she is. The Jackal Alphys is one of the first units that you should have fire in your army because it has target priority. After the Jackal Alphys and its unit, assuming you put the Alphys in a unit, which you probably should, once they fired, everything else that fires at the same target gets to reroll a hit roll of one. So you can see how you can stack the Jackal Alphys and the Ridge Runner to get a surprising amount of effective firepower piled on one enemy unit. And I would also like to point out that this save here is one of the few things from the index errors that has not been corrected. So if you're doing rules as written, which I know so many people love to do, the Jackal Alphys only passes an armor save if you roll a five. A six technically does not save her. But I think we all know rules as intended this is a 5 plus save. So the Jackal Alphys will be wanting to avoid firepower either way, and that's where Master Outrider is useful. In your shooting phase after the unit has fired, if it's not within engagement range, you can move it 6 inches. So it's got a shoot and scoot mechanic, a lot like, say, Eldar Rangers. This will let the Jackal Alphys move out, fire at what you want, use the target priority, then hide again so it can avoid at least direct fire, if not indirect fire. So if you're doing this all mechanized gene steel occult list, it's not the worst idea to have a Jackal Alphys in a unit of Jackals, and then another Jackal Alphys by themselves as a very cheap way to hold objectives and provide a little bit of support to the rest of the army. Just watch out for Overwatch when you do poke your head out. Now this Master Outrider ability, as it's something that the Jackal Alphys can do, so can the unit that the Jackal Alphys has joined. It's not restricted to the model being alone. And joining unit of Atlan Jackals, they all have Scout 9 inches, so you're seeing we now have a very nice army that in theory could be scouting with like everything. You put Metamorphs in your rock grinders and your trucks, they can scout now. So can the Ridge Runners and these Jackal Bikers. Aside from the one unit you're going to leave in your home territory to hold your home objective, your army can be really far up towards the enemy. And while it is a little bit dependent on getting the first turn, you can have a full Alpha Strike army with this mechanized force. The Jackals come in squads of either 5 or 10, and we'll get on to a bit later as to which one is better. Any number of Jackals can replace their close combat weapon with a power weapon, and since it can be done for free now, there's no extra points on it, yes, give them all power weapons. It's the same points, just assume they have their power weapon hidden in a bag at the back of the model. These are one of the more weird units of the Gene Stealer cult, but that doesn't mean they're not fun. They are mostly driving around on their bikes, firing two pistols, and just somehow also managing to coordinate it to keep their bike up. One in every four jackals can have a grenade launcher instead of their pistols, and a unit will include either four jackals or eight because one or two of them are the wolf quads. And yes, the grenade launcher is objectively better than two pistol shots. The only real weapons choices come on the Atalan wolf quads. They will have to have a close combat weapon, they can't switch it out for a power weapon. You need to not forget that they also have the small arms, so when everything else is firing their pistols, they could fire their pistols too, but the only time you're going to want to do that is if you're in close combat with the enemy and it's your shooting phase. Otherwise, you either fire the guns or the pistols. Its main weapon choice are either a heavy stubber, Atlan incinerator, or a mining laser. I don't hate any of them. 
because you're going to be needing to get close to the enemy to fire any of your guns before you charge into combat, a 12 inch range incinerator isn't the worst and it auto hits. The heavy stubber is going to be firing six shots at the same range. Only three of them will hit, probably. It has a longer range if you need it, but probably the incinerator is better. If you want the unit to be able to have a go at anti-tank, the grenade launchers have a crack version and you could have the wolf quad with a mining laser. It's only one shot hitting on a four plus, so you are probably going to miss. But if you do hit, there is a chance to do some damage to an enemy vehicle. Whichever one you like is totally fine. But they have a more important way of doing damage than any of these weapons that they're equipped with. I'll explain that a bit more in a moment. Because I talk so much about Warhammer 40,000 tabletop game, it is hard to get sponsors for things like, oh, I don't know, Made Meadow Regions. As a completely made up game where you can customize a maid and then decide to hire her with over one playable character. Will your maid be smart yet violent or violent, but also quite smart? There are regions that need maids. What will your meadow look like? Comment below on what your favorite aspect of this game is. This is not a real game and I have not received any money to create it. So your financial support in the form of tips is appreciated. If you want to support me, just enjoy another video of mine after this one. If you want to tip me for this video because you've had a great time, I have links to my Ko-Fi in the description. This is not funding to make made meadow regions, but I will do an advert for its non-existent sequel with financial incentives. This video on mechanized rusted claw style gene stealer cult was made at the request of a Ko-Fi supporter. If you are able and willing to give 10 pounds a month, you too can request videos and you get to input on channel decisions that others do not. So back to the bikers. A key way that you can do a lot of damage is with their demolition run. It used to be that you could do a lot more damage with this. The demolition run was every time they complete a normal move, you could throw these demolition charges sort of, but they're not really demolition charges like the Acolytes have. It's their own separate thing that does some mortal wounds. So you are moving close to the enemy using demolition run. Then in the shooting phase, throwing grenades as a stratagem. And if you had the Jackal Alphas in the unit, its own ability of Master Outrider allowed it to make a normal move of up to six inches. So there's a second demolition run and then have a Jackal Alphas in the unit with the Prowling Adjutant enhancement so that when the enemy moved, you could then make a normal move and then do another demolition run because you have finished a normal move. And this wasn't phase locked like things like the Infernus Marines doing Overwatch their ability to do battle shock in the shooting phase wouldn't trigger if they were doing overwatch. The demolition run didn't have this, it wasn't phase locks, it was just every time you made a normal move. This has since been corrected in the July or August patch. We've had a lot of patches since 10th edition was introduced. So now the demolition run is once per battle round. And unlike the demolition charges of the Acolytes, which is you throw one demolition charge per model, this just has to be within range of the unit. Six inch range, and then the mortal wounds happen. I have a visual to explain how this would work when you have a string of bikers and only one of them is within the six inch range to throw the grenades. Hot potato, 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 hot potato. Yep. That's how it works. And they sing that every time. So the demolition run lets you do about five mortal wounds. Five and a half on average if you have the Jackal Alphas in the unit because that is the model in the unit and you roll a d6 for every model in the jackal unit. If you need more help understanding how abilities and things work with characters attached to units and units going with characters, I have a video that explains it that has had a lot of positive feedback. The issue with the Atlan jackals, as soon as you take any casualties, that is reduced. As it's not a battle line unit, this unit of Atlan jackals will only come back on a five plus or a four plus if they got wiped out in the first or second battle round. And when you come back, you need to be wholly within nine inches of the battlefield edge. It's nine inches, as that was changed in September compared to what the cards previously said of six inches. That has not yet been updated online. And you need to have the whole unit wholly within three inches of a cult ambush marker, which is kind of difficult for a squad of 10. So a unit of five may be better than the big unit of 10, assuming that you can trust in your ability to roll a five plus, but it is still possible to get all 10 even with their chunky wolf quad bases around a cult ambush marker. Remember, we're not having to be in range of a single point. It expects you to use a 32 millimeter token, like the ones you got in the eighth edition codex. I have my own version from second edition, which is basically the exact same thing. These have been around for a while. So you have a little bit more space than you would expect, like how adding two inches to the size of pizza 
is a lot more pizza. And it is three inches from the edge of the token, not three inches from the center of the token. So it isn't a six inch diameter, it's more like 7.6 inches. And you can deploy on top of the token. It's only objective markers that you can't end a move or deploy on top of. Unless you're playing in tournaments, then that particular rule for objective markers just goes away. Welcome to Gene Stealer Cult! I hope you studied further maths at your sixth form high school scholia progenium. So a reason to take them in squads of five is it's less of a headache. And the image showing how it can be done, thanks to cracking your bases for the visual. So you can be entirely within six inches of the token and within nine inches of the board edge, as long as there's no terrain being an inconvenience. And it really limits where you can put your cult ambush marker, but something you could do is put it sort of near to the board edge, and then if you wanted, use a nexus to move a cult ambush marker closer to the board edge, so that you could have the Atalan Jackals come from a different token than the one that your opponent thought they were gonna come from. It's not really worth it, but it's something you could do. So the new cult ambush ability has made it more difficult to take 10 Atalan Jackals. You can still fit 20 neophytes quite nicely, because remember, there's even more to this where you need to have every model more than nine inches from the enemy. So these tokens you're putting near to the board edge want to be at least 12 inches from where you think the enemy are going to be able to reach. Otherwise you're just not able to set up the unit again and they're destroyed despite you heroically being able to roll a 5 plus to return the unit to the field. The reason for all these changes to the cult ambush rule was apparently because some tournament players were chaining respawning units around the board from the marker to hit multiple empty objectives. I rarely play at tournaments, most of you don't play at tournaments, and when I do play at tournaments, they have friendly local ones. Sadly, or not, opinions either way, what happens in tournaments affect us all. So while I was deploying my models touching the marker, on the marker, or within three inches of it, I was following what was in the rules commentary. You put a model on and then the rest of those models go within three inches. If only Games Workshop provided FAQs with diagrams. Those are always appreciated. Last edition, the crossfire rule had some pictures which really, really helped us to understand this. This whole mechanized army is going to be very fast. It is going to be able to scout, depending on how many metamorphs you include, and it is going to be able to get around the board very quickly to complete any secondary objectives. But unfortunately, unlike a horde of infantry, you're not getting as many units and you're not going to be able to get as many units back unless you're going to be going for a lot of acolytes and neophytes inside your trucks. If you're enjoying Gene Stealer Cult, I do have a whole playlist on using different units, so make sure that you haven't missed any. You can also join my friendly Discord group linked in the description. And looking at the Atlan Jackals, I want you to remember to bike and subscribe. Potato, potato, potato.